still waiting? All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Breakwater Mega Church. We are the embassy of God because we're ambassadors for Christ. We call ourselves Breakwater Embassy. But we're here to praise the Lord today. Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all you nations, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Continues on. That's, such a, that's an easy chapter to memorize right there. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel say, let the breakwater say, his mercy endures forever. All right? Lord, we come before you this morning, this beautiful day, this Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And Lord, we want to worship you. We want to declare you to be great. We want, to, we want your holiness to be upon us today, Lord. We want to come together as a community of believers to stand before you and to declare your majesty and also to learn from your scriptures that you've given to us, manna from heaven. And so we come before you today and just give this, this time to you and welcome you here in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. All right. His mercy endures forever. That's something worth praising God about, isn't it? Anybody need mercy today? <laughs> Only all of us. <laughs> was lost in darkest night but then I thought I knew the way the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own rebel to your will and if you had not loved me first I would refuse you still but as I ran my hellbound race indifferent to the cost you looked upon 
my helpless state led me to the cross and I beheld God's love displayed you suffered in my place you bore the wrath reserved for me now all I have is grace hallelujah all I have is Christ hallelujah Jesus is my life again hallelujah all I have is Christ hallelujah Jesus is my life. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone. Live so all might see the strength you follow. Your commands never come from me. Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose. And let my song forever be my only boast is you hallelujah all i have is christ hallelujah jesus is my life hallelujah Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day you've given us. We have fall coming in, and 
everything's changing a little bit, Lord, and the wonders you put on the planet for us, Lord, I mean, how can you deny that you are real? The moon, the stars, the sun, the leaves, the trees, they're so beautiful, Lord. Thank you so much for all you've given us. Thank you so much for our families, our friends, and this church, Lord, that does amazing things, Lord. We love you so much, and we pray this in your precious son, Jesus' name. guys appreciate that <clears throat> God is good what do you say all the time aren't you glad about that I'm so thankful I'm uh, just thinking about all the goodness of God he's poured out upon us here at the Breakwater Church the fact that we're a blessing to nations we're real happy about that <clears throat> Uh, just one small announcement before we get into the Word of God. Now we're gonna, the, the ladies are gonna have a devotional journey through Proverbs, uh, beginning in October, and we have on Friday mornings 9:30 five week Bible study. Uh, it's gonna be awesome. Friday mornings 5:30. 9:30. God's not even awake at 5:30. <laughs> You don't want to force him to get up that early, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Good. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, let's get right into the Word of God, shall we? Let's have some, some manna from God. We are in uh, Matthew chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles, you can open up to that. That would be awesome. In our journey to better understand the life and teachings of Jesus, the Messiah, the most significant person that ever lived. As we've noticed before, if you've been here, the <clears throat> four Gospels begin with the pr prophetic declaration of, by John the Baptist about the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we said in any piece of literature, there are times, contexts, and themes that set the frame for everything else that, that comes on. For instance, Sherlock Holmes, what do we know about him? He's an English detective, late 1800s, London. It's going to be a murder mystery, right? So you can't look at Sherlock Holmes and go, why are people riding horses? Well, it's because it's 1800s. So this is the same with the case of John the Baptizer. He comes. He makes prophetic pronouncements. He introduces Jesus as Lord. He preaches repentance, the confession of sins, water baptism, and spirit baptism. And so this sets the framework for the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, but it's also everything that the entire New Testament is all about. Repentance is what? What does he say? Bring forth fruit that shows you've truly repented. <clears throat> Which James would say, faith without works is dead. All of that has to do with showing a life of repentance. Water baptism is very significant, isn't it? If you haven't been water baptized, come see me. We'll baptize you. And spirit baptism, which is for power and fire, is for works of service to the kingdom of God. But John also sets a time marker for the prophetic timeline. In other words, what time is it when Jesus comes? It's judgment time. Each of these components have an Old Testament fulfillment to them. Jesus is downstream from the law and prophets. When Jesus comes, Judaism is in full bloom. The temple's just been rebuilt, beautified by King Herod. You might say it's the high point in Jewish history. However, from this point on, it's downhill. And so we looked at these, these uh, four. We've, we've pulled them out of this portion of John's uh, preaching. John the Baptist... Johnny B, repent, that's typical Old Testament prophetic message. This is the one who was prophesied to come by the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, Isaiah 40, verse 3. The word Lord there is Yahweh in the Old Testament. He's declaring Jesus to be that Lord. I baptize you with water. 
He baptized you with the Holy Spirit and fire. As far as I know, water and fire are two different things. <clears throat> two different baptisms. We I mean, had the four cornerstones. But there's one important time frame consideration that must not be overlooked or minimized as we work our way forward through Matthew's gospel, deeper into the gospel narrative. Are you ready for it? Ready? Okay, let's look for it, shall we? So in this same little section, the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to where John's baptizing in the Jordan River, and he says to them, welcome, friends. It's so good to have you here. So welcoming, isn't he? You brood of vipers. Who warns you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance? Don't think you can say to yourself, we have Abraham our father. Don't think that your election in Jacob is an automatic pass to heaven. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. God's no respecter of persons, is he? Who is this audience? This is the chief leaders, the religious leaders and civil, civic leaders in Israel. Okay? He's not anti-Semitic. He's anti-sin. Yes. It's very important. You, you can separate between those things. Yeah. All right? It's extremely important. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Right? We're all a part of this. We all need to repent. We all need to confess our sins. We all need to be water baptized. We all need Jesus as Lord and Savior. We all need baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we just can't point our fingers at them. These are bad guys. Okay? We're, we're all in the same boat. We want to be fruit-bearing trees. Do we not? Yes. Absolutely. Jesus said the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the nation to produce the fruit of it. We want to be that fruit-producing nation. The axe is already at the root of the trees. That's not good news. None of this is happy talk. His winning fork is in his hand. His threshing floor will be cleared. He's going to take the wheat into the barn and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus is coming. John the Baptist is preaching. The Pharisees and Sadducees come to where he is. They're coming to check him out. They don't want to be baptized. This is a government shakedown. Are you with me? And yet John rails on these guys without mercy. All this harsh language, brood of vipers, coming wrath, uh, axe to the root of the trees, winnowing for. This is not Hallmark card happy talk. It is the time. What time is it? The time of coming wrath. Now, John is recognized by many as a legitimate prophet. So how, how can we understand, better understand this scathing rebuke, this scorching message, message to the political and religious leadership? Well, first of all, we have to look at the Old Testament and see that this is typical of most of the preaching of Old Testament prophets. And the second thing is, is that Israel is on the precipice of judgment, a very severe judgment. And we can best understand the severity of the situation, the time in which Jesus comes, if we view this through the law of Moses and the prophets. And Jesus is going to come and set his watch, the alarm on his watch, for one generation. So we have, as we're looking through Matthew's gospel, we see the tone at the very beginning, set here by John the Baptist, <clears throat> that the axe is laid at the root of the trees. And Jesus says this later on, and once we get through it, we'll, we'll see it, but I want you to see some time markers here. And he talks about all the righteous blood shed on earth from Abel to Zechariah, whom you murdered. He's holding them responsible. I say to you, all these things will come upon what? This generation. So it's not a, just a nebulous cloud. God's going to do something in the future, right? It's going to be, this is going to happen in one generation. Set your watch. Matthew 24, many other places, but just a couple here just so you can see it. As we go through, we'll find out more about this. But he says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. <clears throat> now, because we have the hindsight of history, we know for sure, historically, 
that Israel was evicted from the promised land in A.D. 70 after a lengthy war with the Romans. How many know that? It's just a matter of history. You can look it up, Google it. There's nice uh, stories about it. Josephus writes about it. We have that behind us. So we know that in one generation, the nation of Israel was uprooted, axes to the root, and burnt to the ground, not one stone left upon another. Okay? We know that much. So who are, who are these guys, the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Some of you are new. Some of you have been a long time. If you've ever seen the Jesus film, you get an idea of who they are. I've seen it over 500 times, so it's, it's easy for me to get a picture of these guys. Uh, and it's, there's three major denominations in the, in the Jewish religion at the time of Christ. So you've got the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The Essenes are the guys who live out in Qumran where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. <coughs> There's also Zealots, a minor group. But the Pharisees are the most popular. They're the ones that controlled <coughs> much of the traditions and rules and regulations. And they're also represented on the Sanhedrin, which is the Supreme Court and legislative body of the Jews. The Sadducees came from the leading families. They're the high priests, they're the most powerful members of the priesthood. Now, these guys, Sadducees, insisted that the only, only the laws that were written in the first five books were really binding. All the other stuff about what you do on a Sabbath and if you spit in the ground, roll it up, it constitutes plowing. Jesus you know, took grain in his hands and they said, you know, you're, you're plowing on Sabbath. and All that stuff, the tradition of the elders, they rejected. And they were also known for their denial of the bodily resurrection, angels, and all that stuff. So that's why they were so sad, you see. So the Sanhedrin, who's this? They're the highest ruling body of the Supreme Court of Justice among the Jewish people. 71 members, Sadducees, chief priests, elders, Pharisees. So it was headed by the chief priests. And Romans who controlled the entire Mediterranean region would allow a certain amount of self-government. So these guys handle most of the daily business, and they're the ones that took Jesus, charged him with blasphemy, sent him to Pilate for the trial and sentencing. So this was the highest ruling body of the Supreme Court, and they had their own temple police and whatnot. So they represented the top religious and political leadership in Israel. Now this scathing indictment by John against the highest levels of leadership is noteworthy. Just because you're in a lofty political position, just because you hold high positions in religious hierarchy, doesn't make you free or impervious to corruption. What do you say? It's true. Doesn't matter. Sin is sin no matter where you find it. Corruption is corruption no matter who's spouting it. And John is bold, is he not? He's sticking his neck out here, isn't he? Guess what? He's going to be canceled. He's going to be thrown in prison. He's going to be murdered unjustly. No reason to do it. But that's the nature of corruption. And we want to be tolerant, do we not? We want to be gentle as doves, harmless. We want to be patient with all people. But we shouldn't sacrifice truth on the altar of tolerance. Okay? Not all religions are true. Not all people are honest. Even though you portray yourself on the outside in such a way. Now, if you think about it, the only religion that's wrong today is Christianity. <laughs> right? But there's consequences to being bold. And John has to weigh that, and eventually he is beheaded. Now, normally we think of John as the fiery prophet, and Jesus is the one that blesses the little kids, you know, the friend of sinners and all that. And Jesus also has some very harsh words about the Pharisees. And I'll just rifle through a couple of them. We'll get to more of these as we get deeper into Matthew's gospel. But <clears throat> I want you to see the serious time in which Jesus comes and the amount of corruption that he has to face at the highest levels. 
So the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And Jesus said, you're a brood of vipers. Okay? How can you, being evil, say anything good? Uh, Matthew 23, they got all, a whole list of things there. Teaches the law of Pharisees, calls them hypocrites. He says, when you make a convert, you work really hard. You make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. One more. Blind guides, blind fools, hypocrites, full of greed and self-indulgence, like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but full, full of what? Full of the wrong spirit, full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Serpent, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Wow, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Jesus is not making friends. But he is speaking the truth, is he not? Sticking his neck out. For the record, the Greek word for hypocrite is used 17 times in the New Testament. In Matthew's gospel, 14 times. Mark once, Luke three times. So the Greek word for hypocrite, we've heard a lot lately about it, but it just means actor. That's all it really means originally. It was just someone who's pretending to be someone else in the theater. That's all it was. The reason it's become to be known as someone who's not genuine in their faith is largely because of how Jesus uses it, in my opinion. But it's a Greek word for stage player and actor under assumed uh, character. Pretends to be something other than who he really is. You know, when you're an actor, you're, you're pretending to be something that you're really not. And so it was a custom for uh, Greek theater for them to wear masks and to speak through these masks. And so there's two kinds of math here, and there's two kinds there, right? So now theater originated in ancient Greece. It came from them. And the celib- it was to celebrate their gods and to educate people and to watch plays on religious holidays. Now, in the Jewish religion, this is important. Raise your hand if you heard me. Okay, so in Jewish religion, there was a total opposition to theater. They considered it. Uh, idol worshiping and they prohibited it because of uh, creating images uh, in the likeness of gods, the gods. So for the Jews and the Talmud and their traditions, the theater and circuses were uh, centers of idolatry. Okay? So the point, the point here is that the Jews did not have actors or theaters, only the Greeks and Romans who worship false gods. So the theater belonged to pagan idol worshipers, foreigners. So now you're calling the Jewish leaders hypocrites. You're saying, he's saying to them, you are polytheistic Gentiles pretending to be Jewish. You are pagan Greeks masquerading as Jews. In other words, you're wolves in sheep's clothing. You are actors. You're not authentic. Your heritage is Jews. Your outward appearance means nothing if you have no actual fruit. It's all pretense. It's like a stunt double. Okay? What does the stuntman person do? Plays the role of another actor who's playing the role of another person. So the stuntman is like three people away from anything that has to do with reality. So he says, you're not even Jewish. You're, you're Greek and Roman actors. You're just in a theater. So, done with that. This is in Athens, a leftover from one of their theaters. Anyway, the coming of Jesus is the last attempt to bring Israel to repentance. And now we know a few things. They were rejected from the promised land. And many of the teachings of Jesus, as we go through, will have to do with this impending wrath. So we'll see Jesus giving different teachings as we go through, and we will want to know how to understand those hard sayings. In order to do that, we have to go back to the Law and Prophets. That's what we should do. So it's my contention that Jesus is the last Old Testament prophet, okay? Now, on the theology test, that would be the wrong answer. 
but I'm going to try and convince you today this is the right answer. There are 16 prophetic books in the Old Testament. They come from a narrow time frame from Amos to Malachi. In this prophetic period, if you read through anything in the Old Testament, it's always pretty harsh. And it basically focuses on the fulfillment of the bad news as described in the covenant, covenant of Moses given on Mount Sinai, Deuteronomy 28 to 30. Everybody should read that as a background for understanding what's happening in the New Testament. So if you did anything else in the next couple of days, read through Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30. And so when we read through the teachings of Jesus, we'll see that reflected and taken directly from there. So we know that in the Gospels, John the Baptist is considered a prophet. Jesus is considered a prophet by many people. And yet we're taught by experts to interpret the message through the paradigm of the new covenant. What's paradigm? It's a system. In other words, when we think of Jesus, we think of him as new covenant. For instance, one of my favorite people, Gordon Feed, <clears throat> Douglas Stewart. How to Study the Bible for All It's Worth. It's a great book. Everybody should get it. It's still in print. <clears throat> but they say <clears throat> the Law and the Prophets came to an end once John the Baptist began to preach the New Covenant. I'll drink to that. So this is the right answer on Theology 101 Test in Bible School. Okay? However, it's wrong. It's the wrong starting point for understanding New Testament. It's the wrong starting point to understand the teachings of John and Jesus. John did not preach the New Covenant. Did he? No. <laughs> so, Placing of John the Baptist as the end of the Law and Prophets and Jesus as the beginning of the New Covenant creates an incorrect starting point for everything that has to do with Jesus. And, and it leads to a lot of misunderstanding of the Gospels as you read through it. Instead, my opinion, John and Jesus should be among the narrow band of prophets who preach to Israel through the paradigm of the Mosaic Covenant. Okay? Now, there should be, there's no other way to properly assess the teaching of John or Jesus oncoming wrath until you understand that from an Old Testament perspective. And it gets clearer as we go through Matthew's gospel. So, so hang on. So it's my conclusion that Jesus is not the beginning of the new covenant. He's the ending of the old. He's not the first prophet of the new covenant. He's the last prophet of the old. Jesus came to do what? Fulfill what? Law and prophets. And if he fulfills law and prophets, then he's the end of the law and prophets, not John. Okay? So let's say you're going to go hiking up at La Jolla State Park, and we're all going to meet up there, and you go to Leo Carrillo. What? You're in the wrong starting point. You're not going to find anybody, right? You're not going to get to the right place. You have to start in the right place to get to the right place. <clears throat> now, you won't learn this. This is what you learn in school. What I'm telling you is a principle, is a foundation necessary for really interpreting the Gospels uh, makes it, makes it uh, important. So even when you get to Matthew 24 and some of the difficult sayings, the judgment sayings of Jesus, if we can go back and read it through Law and Prophets, it helps us get a clearer picture rather than taking the book of Revelation and reading back into Jesus. Does that make sense to anybody? Yes. Okay, hope so. You won't learn this in Bible school. At least I didn't. you only learn it here. And you don't need to adopt my thesis of John the Baptist and Jesus as the last of Old Testament prophets, okay? It's not necessary. Since Gordon Fee, PhD, disagrees with me. <laughs> However, I'll stick with the Bible. How about that? I like Gordy. So when the question was asked, who, let's do a market analysis here. What's the scuttlebutt on the street? What are people saying? Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Who is, who is, who am I to the people? They immediately go where? Prophets. You're, you're John the Baptist, who was a prophet. You're Eli How, where's Elijah in the list of prophets? Up or low? Top guy. Of the Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah also is the guy that preached on the cusp of 
judgment to Israel. If you remember 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar took the southern kingdom captivity to Babylon, okay? So Jeremiah is a voice of judgment. He go, they go, you're like that guy. <laughs> or one of the prophets. So immediately they say, you're one of the prophets. What prophets? Well, we call them Old Testament prophets, but in this day and age there is no Old Testament, right? It's just scripture as far as they're concerned. So the, the list of prophets begins with Amos, should end with Jesus, not Malachi or John the Baptist. The teachings of John and Jesus should be interpreted in the light of Moses and typical Old Testament prophetic genre. All in favor? So the Jews understood Jesus as a Hebrew prophet, and we should look through the law of Moses, Psalms, prophets, Proverbs, for a more accurate interpretation of the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels. And this is how I approach the study of Matthew. So let's see what Johnny B. and Jesus have to say about these coordinates. <clears throat> Again, John, I baptize the water. He's more powerful. How more powerful is Jesus? So much powerful, right? How much more powerful is his baptism? A lot more powerful than water. He comes to John. John has been pontificating, preaching. This guy's coming. The Lord's coming. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes, and John wants to be baptized by him. Why not? Right? He's just telling everybody. He's all hyped up. Wow, he's here. I want to be the first one in line. And he goes, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus says, chill. Take it easy. I got a lot of things that have to take place biblically. There's a lot of scripture that got to be fulfilled. I, we got to take care of other things. So right now, just water baptize me. Just relax. Please take it easy. Let it be so for now. It's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Do I have this? Yeah, all means what? All means all. Every kind of, all sorts of. He's come to fulfill, which means to cram it to the top, make it complete, bring it to a completion. Nothing lacking, full measure, complete in every particular way. Jesus says, I've come to fulfill all things. Matthew 5, just jump ahead real quick. He says, I didn't come to abolish law and prophets. I have come to fulfill them. Okay, same word. He says, not one single small jot or letter, stroke of a pen will disappear until what? So what's Jesus? He's in a law and prophet fulfillment mode. And when he's called upon to explain his actions, where do they go? Old Testament. In Matthew's gospel in particular, how many times does it say, in fulfillment of what the prophets say, in fulfillment of what the prophets say, just over and over again. So Jesus didn't come after the law had stopped. He came to complete the whole thing and to bring it to an end. Nothing will be abolished. Nothing will disappear until everything is accomplished. Jesus came to fulfill even the smallest little digit of the Mosaic law and the prophets. Law, prophets. <clears throat> Just to show you a little bit more of this. After his death and resurrection, his whole life, all his ministry, Luke 24, he gets his people together. And he says, I already told you all this, but I'm going to tell you again. Right? <clears throat> Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. The law, the prophets, and Psalms. So when was the law of Moses terminated or the old covenant that relates to Moses, that covenant? When was that? What do you think? Remember when Jesus says it's finished? Where was, where was he when he said it's finished? It's on the cross. Yeah, it's finished. Check it out. Knowing that what? All was now finished... He said this to fulfill scripture, I thirst. Receive the vinegar, he says, now it's finished. It's all done, done it all. It is finished. So many things wrapped up in what is finished there. The payment for sin is finished. 
the covenant. Colossians chapter 2, you're dead in your sins. Were we dead in sins? I don't know. I was pretty alive to sin when I was a sinner. Yeah. Sin was my life. Buy it, sell it. (laughs) I'm lucky to be alive. God made you alive with Christ. If Christ is in you, there's a new life that's in you. Okay? It's a life-changing life of the Holy Spirit. He forgave all of our sins. I had plenty. He can have them all. But check it out. Not only did God forgive our sins, but he canceled the written code with his regulations. What is he talking about? All that stuff, right? All the things. And what it, where did this happen? It was on the cross. And he disarmed powers and principalities, triumphing over them by what? Triumphing over them by the cross. And he goes to list some of the things that have been done away with and canceled that were a part of the written code, which were enlarged by the Talmud and all those sorts of things. Religious festivals, new moons, Sabbath day. These are shadow of the things that were to come. The reality is found in Christ. Christ is a reality. Aren't you glad about that? Hallelujah. All of that done away with. He himself is our peace, talking about Jesus. He abolished in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. And his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two and to reconcile them to God through what? Through the cross. Abolished the law through the cross. And this could go on and on forever, but we won't. What does the Bible say? Christ is the end of the law. It's hard to disagree with that, you know what I'm saying? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Jesus came to put an end to the law of Moses and to fulfill and finish all the terms of the Sinai covenant. He brought the end to the law by his death on the cross. Up? Up, up, Jesus? All right. Here's the book. Law and Prophets came to an end. John the Baptist. Christ is the end of the law. Law and Prophets came to an end with John the Baptist. Whoops. Show me one verse in the Bible where John the Baptist preached the new covenant. The placing of John the Baptist as the end of the law and prophets and Jesus as the beginning of the new covenant is an incorrect trailhead. Distorts our understanding of the gospel. makes it much more difficult. I've been at this a long time and if any of you have given up trying to understand theology, it's partly due to the fact that we have the wrong starting point. Jesus should be considered the last of the Hebrew prophets. He's the end of the law, not his cousin John. So therefore, Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, should be interpreted through law, psalms, and prophets. There's no other way to properly assess the teaching of Johnny B. or Jesus. Now, tremendous respect for Fee and Stuart. Have the book, recommend it. But books are people, are they not? It's like having a conversation with somebody. Just because it's written in a book doesn't make it right. You know, you could, when you talk to people, you have a little give and take. So when I read a book, I go, yeah, that's okay. This is good. No, 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 I don't agree with that because of this and that and the other thing. There's actual science to this, right? There's actually some energy that needs to be put into reading books and commentaries and, and understanding how to interpret Scripture. And this is a very important principle that will help us as we go through here. So the New Covenant didn't begin with John the Baptist. It didn't begin with the birth of Jesus. It was initiated by his death and the coming of the Holy Spirit and power in Acts chapter 2. Everyone agrees that's the birthday of the church, the beginning of the new covenant. So how can John be the end of the law and the Holy Spirit come here? And where's Jesus? He's like mush in the middle or something. (laughs) So I'm going to trust Christ before commentaries. Now the first place in any of the Gospels where there's any mention at all of a new covenant is at the Last Supper, which you'd expect it to be now that we know, right? So Jesus said, it's my blood that ratifies this new agreement because covenant just means an agreement. We had an old agreement at Mount Sinai. It's come to an end with shedding of his blood. My blood now ratifies the new one. 
And it's shed on behalf of many so that they can have their sins forgiven. That's why. That's what his death is all about. And Luke says, this is the cup that's poured out for you. It's the new covenant of my blood. That's why we're so thankful for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The, the, the bread represents his beaten, broken, crucified body. The wine represents his blood, which is soon to be shed on the cross. This is an agreement. So we agree to give God our sins. He agrees to give us forgiveness. We agree to serve him and bear fruit. Right? That's our agreement. How many agree? <laughs> That's what Holy Communion is about. When you take Holy Communion, you say, I'm agreeing that Jesus died for my sins and that I am committing myself to serving him in my generation. What a significant event that is. Do you know what an honor and privilege it is to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Of all the people in the world, billions of people in the world, we have this treasure in this earthen, earthen vessel. Whew. We're going to live forever with Jesus. Wow. So the new covenant is going to replace the Mosaic covenant, rendering, and where's that promised? In the Old Testament. We'll take some time to look at that. Not today. Jesus shed his blood for many. Did he share his blood for you? Absolutely. Is it, is it still powerful today for the changing of hearts and lives? Can it take the worst criminal and turn him into a saint? After his death and resurrection, he met with his people again. He opened their minds so they can understand scripture. Notice it's not Old Testament. What do they call it? The scriptures. There's no New Testament. Okay? It's not old. This is the scriptures. And he opened their minds. You know, when you get born again, you get the Holy Spirit, it's just like your, your brain is open up to all that God has. It's so incredible. It used to be I lived at billboard level. You know what I'm saying? What's happening on the billboard? Advertisement level, life, right here. But when you get born again, it opens your brain to the God and the cosmic reality that we can walk with the creator of all things. And then there's, there's new life and new energy, new thoughts. It's great. You got to be open-minded to God, right? This is what was written. The Messiah, the Christ, will suffer, rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness will be preached in his name to all nations. Then he says, I'm going to send you what my father promised. Don't leave Jerusalem until you're clothed with power, power from on high. John the Baptist said, Jesus is coming, right? He's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, no, no, I've got to take care of business. I've got to fulfill all these things. On the cross, he says it's finished. Now he says, hey, we're ready. Don't leave Jerusalem till you get the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've read this so many times that we don't even appreciate how significant this is. But Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my father promised. Who could say that? Who in the world has a right to say, I am going to the Father and ask him to send the Holy Spirit. Who in his right mind could ever say something like that? Right? So you got Jesus going to the Father to send the Holy Spirit. What's that? Trinity, Trinity right? Father made the promise. Jesus purchased the promise on the cross. The Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of the Father's promise to clothe all nations with high-voltage power. Lastly, starts again in Acts. After his death, during a period of 40 days, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And the last thing he said was, wait for the promise of the Father. John baptized with water. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we see John predicting that. Now Jesus purchasing it and the promise of the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost. So now we have sort of a complete view of that. All righteousness is accomplished. It's finished. The Holy Spirit can come. 
and birthed the Christian era. So, the question is, have you received the forgiveness of sins that Jesus provides, provided for you? How do you receive that? You simply ask, don't you? Did you have to go on a pilgrimage? Did you have to contort your body in some strange uh, box? Did you have to say endless prayers and go on fasts and whatnot? Mm -mm. No. No. Just come to Jesus. It's a gift, is it not? It's a gift of God's mercy and grace that Jesus paid the full price for by his death and resurrection. And then have you received the baptism with the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is an energy from God. It's a gift, is it not? It's, a, it's, a, it's gifts from God that enables you to do the job he's called you to do. The kingdom of God, large and small, doesn't matter, right? According to who you are and how God made you. And we have the Holy Spirit to give us the resources to make that happen. All right? Let's pray, shall we? If you need the forgiveness of sins today, simply ask Jesus for that. Father, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I want to lay my sins down before you. I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. I want to walk with you forever and ever. Prayer from your heart. With your heart, your mouth confesses Jesus is Lord. He rose again from the dead. And if you need more from the Holy Spirit, you can ask him even now as we come before him in worship. Come before him with thanksgiving. Open up your bucket. Ask Jesus to fill it up. Father, we just thank you so much that your word is true and never ends. Your mercy is everlasting. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be a part of your family. And, Lord, we just pray that you continue to energize us to serve you and make you known in our generation. So even though, even now, Lord, we come before you and ask that you would speak to us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of his mercy As deep cries out too deep We say, come Lord Jesus, come Say, come, Lord, Jesus, come. Yeah. We say, come, Lord, Jesus, come. We say, come, Lord, Jesus, come. All who are thirsty, all who are Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of his mercy As deep cries out too deep And we say, come Lord Jesus, come Say, come, Lord, Jesus, come. We say, come, Lord, Jesus, come. We say, come, Lord, Jesus, come. Won't you come? Your will for
As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. We wait upon the Lord. Strength will come as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong say goodbye to our viewing audience. Huh? We're good. Okay. Now, we've officially ended that part of it. We want to now continue to worship God. And uh, we've got some, some more music going on here. But if you need prayer today for anything, we want to pray for you. It's also uh, an opportunity for us to tithe and offer. It's right there. We have church plants we want to do in Africa. We've got three. we got young girl we're sending to college. We've got a lot of stuff that we're doing to make an impact in the world. If you want to be a part of that, that's what the Tide Lounge is for right there. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for coming. If you want to